Hello. We're here. Law Talk edition number two. Um, I'm Gary Wise from Wise Law Office in Toronto, and I'm joined by my friends who will introduce themselves now. How do you want to go around? <laughs> okay, I'm Mitch Kowalski from Toronto. Omar Herbada from Toronto. Oh, Omar, you talked over me. Go for okay, it. Omar, go. No, you, Bob. You should just go clockwise. Clockwise. <laughs> Bob Tarantino. I, I nominate Toronto. Bob Tarantino. Bob Tarantino from Toronto. Bob Tarantino's here. Bob Tarantino. Everybody, let's talk about Bob. Also, Bob from Tarantino's Toronto. here. Bob, I'm still here. We're all from Toronto. It's so it's so so diverse an organization. No, but I teach at University of Calgary. Big shout out to okay. Dinos. <laughs> well. <laughs> Welcome both. Well, welcome to all of you <laughs> once again. Um, we we noticed the the absence of Mr. Kowalski's sunglasses, and we, we understand that um, there's a reason for that. Would you care to, to fill us all in, Mitch? Yeah, unfortunately, last time, as cool as it looked, and I know it did look very cool, I <laughs> I I, uh, I lost my sunglasses, and it Kowalski appears that Omar has found them. Omar sunglasses. Yeah. Shades of Omar, if we could put it that way. Shades yes, here from Wise Law Studios. <laughs> so we have a couple of the things we've. This is about. what happens when you smoke weed. Well, hey, that's exactly really? what we're going to we're we're talk about that now. Um, our first topic tonight is prosecuting Toronto's pot shop pop ups, and anybody who's been walking around downtown Toronto over the last six weeks or so can't help but notice. That it seems like there's another pot dispensary opening up on every single block. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Toronto bylaw enforcement and police um, en masse appears to have closed down a whole bunch of them. Um, they're popping up again, though. And uh, as a matter of research for tonight's um, law talk, I actually went in to two of those stores last night. And research. it was quite amusing um, on, on Spadina. Because we went into the first one, and the young lady who was working there, the first thing she said to me is, have you shopped here before? And I said, no, it's actually my first time. And she said, well, where do you usually shop? And I said, well, I really don't. I just, I'm here to find out. I'm not sure what the correct answer is. It's like a guy and a car. A guy who has a car, that's where we usually shop. But in any event, um, she refused to to serve me um, because, as she indicated, her establishment was medical, not medicinal, not recreational. Um, but she was nice enough to refer me to another establishment on Queen Street that apparently is entirely recreational. So we kept walking and two doors down um, on Spadina was yet another one um, that was much friendlier upon arrival. And I was immediately um, given the opportunity to go to see their doctor who works in the back room, who would spend a few moments with me and presumably take care of my order. And we were in far too much of a hurry for me to continue the experiment beyond that. But uh, back to the, 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 the main topic, what, what do you guys think about the action of Toronto bylaw enforcement and police in terms of shutting these places down? You, you want to take that one first, Omar? Mitch, go ahead. Okay, Mitch, go ahead. Uh, it, it's it's long overdue. I, I I have these shops popping up all the way down around my street, and I have been sorely disappointed by the lack of enforcement up until now. The law is pretty clear, and uh, it's it's unclear to me why uh, these people think that they can just open up whenever they feel like it. As we all know, there are only four things that are certain in this world, death taxes. Well, three things, death taxes and broken promises by politicians. So it, it's just absolute folly to uh, open up a shop and spend money on a lease and kit it all out on the basis of a, a promise that may or may not happen. So good on, good on the Toronto police. So let me speak from a couple of different perspectives. So I, I live in Kensington Market, which probably has the highest concentration yes. of these types of shops in the city. Uh, tell so us about, uh, Tell us about living in the heart of darkness. The heart of darkness. So uh, like I said, I live in Kensington. We have an awful lot of these shops. Uh, I'm also somebody who believes rather fervently that... Uh, 
drugs should at a minimum be decriminalized and, and more properly should be legalized uh, and that that's really based on a fairly kind of foundational principle that to a large extent, it's really not the government's business to criminalize what I put into my body. Uh, it, it might be a, a criminal act or a breach of regulatory policy for somebody to sell me something which is hazardous or which is poisonous or which will do me harm. Uh, but in terms of me actually ingesting it, I, I, I fail to see where the state has a uh, sort of a... Bob. Bob, let me let me let me throw you this out to well, you. Well, well, Mitch, give everyone a chance here. Come on. No. Oh, Mark, take it away. So, so, in any event, let me let me just say, um, you know, I, I've seen, and I don't I don't want to sort of speak for Omar, um, but I, you know, I, I read what he wrote on Slaw and, and the conversation that he had with a a number of the commenters on his post on Slaw. Um, I, you know, I oh, think on, in no terms of the strict. No, I, I won't. But I think in terms of the strict kind of, you know, legal analysis of whether or, or the extent to which the enforcement of the criminal law is really a matter of discretion for a variety of players, uh, I think Omar is right. I think where I would go beyond Omar's argument is to say, I, I don't think that the promise that, that has been made by the government goes far enough. Um, and, and I think it's regrettable that their, their plan at the moment is really legalization of personal possession, uh, which I think is is you know the bare minimum of what we should be doing as a as a policy matter, um, and in terms of the the sort of the advisability of the the enforcement actions that have been taken in and of themselves, so the recent crackdown, to me it just strikes me that it, it's really a regrettable sort of use of resources on the part of the police and the court system. All right, I'll go, I'll go next. And we want to hear from Gary too, Mitch, before you sort of jump in there and run all over everyone. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of highlight my position, which I think Bob is right. It's probably somewhere in between Bob and Mitch. The, the government does have a legitimate interest here. They have a legitimate interest in terms of shutting down stores that don't have a, a legal authority to be operating. And, I, and I'm not too concerned about them shutting down stores and perhaps even seizing inventory especially if these stores are operating perhaps in close proximity to schools or if they're selling to uh, minors, for example. I mean, because these are examples of situations where even when marijuana does become legalized in Canada, it's unlikely that uh, they'll be able to operate in that fashion. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them shutting down certain marijuana dispensaries, seizing their inventory if they, if they need to. What I really have a problem with here is the imposition of criminal code charges. And I think that goes well beyond. We're criminalizing matters uh, which don't necessarily need to be criminalized. Our courts are already uh, swamped with, with uh, small cases. And, and again, the point that, that Bob is referencing to that I've written about is that we can take lesson from Vancouver here. Uh, Vancouver, which was the leader in uh, medical marijuana dispensaries well beyond the current government, they, their history there goes back at least 10, 15 years. I remember seeing it in, in Vancouver. And, and, and the, the, the police there, the Vancouver police, have actually opted not to shut these places down unless there's a risk to minors, unless there's something that, like a fire code violation that they need to address because they've come to the conclusion that there's more important things in society to focus on. And, and to that effect, uh, Vancouver's uh, city council this past week actually just issued bylaws or created bylaws to, to create a licensing scheme. Okay, so they actually... Uh, are now licensing these dispensaries, even though under the federal law, they're still illegal. Well, may I? Please. I, I, it, may, it comes to a surprise, as a surprise to me and probably to all of you. I, I agree almost entirely with Mitch on this. Um, I say shut them all down. Oh. And the reason I say that is that they're so flagrantly um, attempting yeah. to float the law um, openly, notoriously, and our government needs to decide how it's going to legislate this. Our government needs to figure out what the distribution channels are going to look like. And these operations, 
um, are simply trying to do an end run around the entire process um, to gain an unfair advantage. And I have a couple of questions about who's really behind these organizations or the, these operations. They're, they're not getting their supply from the medical marijuana dispensaries that are licensed. So where are they getting their supply from? <clears throat> Who financed the um, opening of what looks like dozens, if not even hundreds of, of, of retail locations in the span of three or four weeks um, in the city of Toronto? And all of it looks pretty fishy to me. Um, and while I am entirely in favor of legalization, not just decriminalization, I'm entirely in favor um, of a retail um, model that isn't the LCBO, um, but one that's carefully monitored and regulated. Um, I don't think these guys um, deserve any breaks from the law at all. And, you know, you, you, if you're going to do it openly, when you know what you're doing is, is prohibited by law, then you're taking your chances and don't be surprised when they come and shut you down um, and you lose all your money. And um, I think that's perfectly fair game. Yeah, hundred percent. You can't, yeah, can't have the wild west. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, even go down the road of whether it should be decriminalized or not. The, the fact of the matter is, the law is a hundred percent clear now. And you know, as Gary said, it's the wild west out there. Guys just doing whatever the heck they feel like it because, because they, you know, the prime minister said when you know when we went for an election that this is going to happen. Um, and and without a rules as to you know how what the location should be where these pot places and look there's schools all over the city of toronto and the distributors yeah. are all over the city willy-nilly you know in you know in detroit they've regulated uh much like i guess vancouver is trying to do now and said okay medical marijuana this is where you have to be you can only be in certain parts of the city you open to certain hours it's highly regulated i don't have a problem with that but right now um doing an end run as as gary said is is just insanity um and it, i guess my my point bob you're talking about whether the government should regulate what we put in our bodies the the problem with weed is it's not just in your body it's in the atmosphere and I can tell you that on the third floor of my building, when I walk off the elevator, I go by the room, the, the apartment that just steams out into the corridor. And there are kids living on that corridor, yeah. and it just reeks like hell. The elevator reeks like hell. Everything reeks like hell. And that's a problem for me. I don't want to, if you want to smoke weed, I don't want to smell it. You know what? Mitch's argument here in a nutshell is marijuana consumption is contributing to climate change. And for that reason, you must stop it. That's well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to violate your constitutional right to get high, but um, yes. Yeah. True. So look, I think the, the challenge that we're facing is we're in this sort of, liminal stage, right? Where it, it's not entirely certain what the law is going to look like, let's say, six months from now, a year from now, whatever. Um, and for all of the uniformity that we would want from the enforcement of criminal law, that's simply not the case at the moment, right? Like we have different jurisdictions enforcing this in different ways. And at least in Canada, we've historically taken the view that sort of, you know, where your feet are planted shouldn't be the determining factor as to whether your conduct is criminal, right? And, and yet at the moment, depending on what a particular municipality has elected to do in terms of its resource allocation, conduct that is you know, resulting in criminal charges in Toronto is not resulting in criminal charges in London, Ontario, or Vancouver. Um, and so I, I think inescapably we get into that deeper question of, okay, well, what should the policy be here? And so it, it's difficult for us, or it's difficult for me at least, to sort of opine on the advisability or, or the, the, the justness of, of the 
the Toronto actions without delving into, okay, well, why or, or what should the policy be on a more fundamental level? And, and Mitch, I, I get what you're saying about, you know, you don't, your preference would be that, that, you know, pot smoking be outlawed in certain areas or whatever. And I don't smoke pot. I've, I've actually, I've never tried it. Um, it. It's really not something I'm interested in doing, but I'm, I'm very interested in defining what the ambit of the criminal law is. And for my money, you know, the Trudeau's go the Trudeau government's failing in this regard is that they're not acting quickly enough. Um, and, you know, that was the, the same failing of the Harper government before it and the Gretchen government and the Martin government before that. Like, this is just not something that we should be criminalizing. Um, and, and so to sit there and say that, well, it, you know, at the moment it's criminal and therefore we should be hammering down on people who are, who are violating the, 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 the letter of the law. You know, we just don't do that for other things. Uh, and I'm not sure what marks out marijuana dispensing as something which you know absolutely should be the the subject of the full weight of the of the criminal justice system well i think that the, there's a historical reason why we haven't had these dispensaries yet um we can agree or disagree about what the what the law has been um we i i think that the enforcement has always been selective um and we know that that selectivity um, often has a racial component to it, at least on the possession side. But I, I think we're, we are dealing with, with a new form of retail trafficking. And while the law may change um, with respect to possession um, and decriminalizing will, decriminalization will certainly hit that, I'm not, not so sure what the law is going to say about trafficking um, and dispensing um, the, the, the word of the month to describe trafficking. But one thing I am sure about is that, that there's no color of right for these locations to be out there opening up um, willy-nilly, taking away any, any zoning um, options for municipal governments who want to control where and how um, it's sold. And, and while schools are one factor that you've mentioned a couple of times, I frankly note that LCBOs are open close to schools everywhere. I'm not sure that's the operating um, principle that we, we need to be working on. But the bottom line is the government is in the process of creating regulations. And this is just a, a, it's a dressed up form of civil disobedience. It's really just criminal behavior by, once again, um, entities that I have some suspiciousness about. I'm not sure it's the good guys who are behind these places. And so again, I agree I with Gary. I agree. Look, I mean, I'm with you, Gary. I actually know for, I think I can say it with some certainty because I've made some of my own investigations um, out of my own curiosity. And, and, and no, I, I believe there's actually criminal investigations. The, I, I believe there is criminal enterprise behind uh, many of these dispensaries, if not all of them. So, you know, there probably is Hells Angels and organized crime behind many of them, if not all. But this is where I go back to my point. There is a distinction, or at least we should be having in our conversation here, a distinction between shutting down dispensaries which don't have a legal authority to operate, and then the imposition of criminal charges, not necessarily on the people who are sourcing the illegally grown marijuana, but on individuals who are operating these facilities and selling them, which <laughs> the doctor who wanted to help you out, Gary, and that's who you want to actually press criminal charges. That seems to me, is, Omar, you're, you're saying it's it's okay to shut them down, but but don't be so mean to them. And I... Um, it's not about mean. Well, in in fairness, I, I don't think this is the biggest issue on the planet either. But uh, you're, you're I, I think... You're taking up our court system. Once, once, the, once they're doing this openly and notoriously, we have to decide whether there's rule oh, of law not. in Canada or not. And I don't think looking the other way at this kind of a scale makes any sense in terms of law enforcement. Yeah, 100%. But, but I'm not sure how we draw a distinction. Okay, so to, to, to cite... Well, the distinction is the law. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let, let, let's, to cite something that Omar mentioned and that I've written on, uh, you know, it's illegal under the Criminal Code of Canada to sell comic books which depict the commission of a crime. I can walk down virtually, the, you know, the streets of virtually any neighborhood in Toronto and find a store which is selling comic books which violate the letter of that law. 
those laws have not been enforced in any meaningful way in at least 40 years. Uh, and I think anybody who tried to enforce them would, you know, irrespective of the technical legal arguments about charter violations, you know, would be widely viewed as wasting time and doing something which is, which is in a foundational or in a very fundamental way unjust. But that's the law. That's the criminal code of Canada, right? Section 163.1b makes it a crime to sell those comic books. Nobody sits there and says, well, what the hell are the cops doing? They're letting this happen flagrantly in, in, in the face of children walking by and buying these things in close by schools. But we all agree at, at some fundamental level that that's okay. And we don't think that those people should be charged. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I wanna understand sort of what the distinction is between selling comic books, which is illegal, and selling pot, which is also illegal. To, to take Bob's point further, uh, I'm not sure people are aware, but there actually was a, a legal action by a resident in Vancouver who sort of sounded like our guys on the top of the screen here. They're, they were just fed up. They said, enough with these dispensaries. They're everywhere. And it's not about the consumption. I think the consumption issue is a different issue. But the sale of the, this product in their neighborhoods had annoyed them. And they said, look, the law is the law is the law. Why is Vancouver police not doing we something We don't know who our it. audience yeah. on this is. But you have to describe what Kensington neighborhood is in Toronto, okay? A couple of weed stores in Kensington Market is not going to disrupt the flavor or the character of the neighborhood. In fact, if anything, it enhances it. It's very much in character with the, the type of neighborhood that it is. And so that's not a priority from my perspective uh, for many of the residents in that area. That's the reason why the stores went there. Sure. But this, but the stores on Queen West and the beach or Queen East and the beaches, the ones on St. Clair West near me, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not the little niche hipster areas that, that determine that, that, uh, you know, weed is cool. So it fits with our neighborhood. It's like everywhere. I drive by these things consistently in my neighborhood and I'm just astounded that, and I don't live in a hipster neighborhood unlike Bob. So I'm, I'm just very staid St. Clair West general, general population. I got weed stores that are, are, are popping up all over the place. So. Element at all. so the, the, the legalization of this, if anything, from my perspective is going to stamp out uh, the criminal element when it comes to marijuana entirely. So yeah, the, I, would, I would profoundly disagree with that. And I, I don't think that the decriminalization or legalization of, of marijuana is going to have much, if any, of an impact on the, on the criminal involvement. And it, you know, as evidence of that, I only need to point to the, the ads that I hear on the radio, which the province of Ontario is currently running, about how the sale of illegal cigarettes is, you know, accounts for a third of the volume of, of cigarettes that are sold in the province. And that's a major source of revenue for organized crime in, in the province. The notion that the government is going to successfully manage to regulate this in a way which will obviate the ability of organized crime to make a profit to me is just a fantasy. Um, so again, you know, that's why I think that kind of teleological kind of ends motivated arguments for the decriminalization of drugs are wrong headed because ultimately then if we can demonstrate that in fact we won't have a positive impact on the involvement of, of, of organized crime in the, in the marketplace, then we shouldn't be decriminalizing or legalizing the drug. And that's exactly the wrong sort of approach to take the question of whether something should be criminal be subject to the sanction of the criminal law uh, i think ultimately should be based on philosophical principles about you know the justifiability of the state's incursion into the personal <clears throat> space rather than ends based because once we get into ends based we start questioning whether the ends are justified by the means and that's just simply not how we should be approaching the question of criminal regulation. Okay, well, is, is, there, is there anyone among us who doesn't uh, favor decriminalization in, in, in some form? Who doesn't Kowalski? favor... 
You know what? I, I, if, I don't have a problem with it if it's regulated, right? If, if it's regulated and you buy it in a certain way with certain guidelines and certain rules, and if, if it's treated like cigarettes and you can't smoke it, where people can't smoke cigarettes because I think there's there uh, are people who believe that marijuana is not the same as cigarettes, so it's not going to be subject to those same rules. As long as you scope out all the guidelines, I'm okay with it. But right, I, I have a problem with people just doing whatever they want. Okay, well, and that, that's where I am on this too. I, I just simply think that those who are doing an end run around the law probably need to be lassoed a bit. Um, until the government decides how it's going to distribute this. And I think that the consumers who want this product can wait a couple of months um, to get the answers. And in the meanwhile, I'm not sure having these places pop up on every single corner of downtown Toronto is necessarily building the Toronto most Torontonians want to have. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm not prudish about this at all. I don't really care. If they're out there, they're out there. But I, I think... You need to have an evil, even playing field for everyone. Um, the government may well want to control distribution with an LCBO type of operation. I know the LCBO union is certainly, certainly advocating for that. And I, I think we need to let our legislators do what our legislators do. Um, and this is going to land where it's supposed to land within a certain period of time. And I, I also agree entirely, Bob, that, that wh whatever regulation occurs here, there's still going to be a black market in weed. Um, there's going to be a black market that's going to serve as high schools. There's going to be a black market that's going to be less expensive than whatever the government is doing or maybe has different product than what the government is selling. This isn't going to eradicate um, the, the illegal channels for marijuana. But, you know, as a, a very good friend of mine recently got a medical license and her comment on it is she just got tired of doing something that was illegal. She got tired of sneaking around and looking over her shoulder um, every time she went to buy um, from that guy on the corner or wherever she was buying. And she felt terrific that she could actually now have a legal channel to do something that, in her case, helps her with some digestive issues and, and sleep-related issues. And, you know, for people in, in those circumstances, this is really a godsend. Um, whether the, the recreational user should be treated any differently, frankly, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that the, the medicinal versus recreational distinction is, is marketing, not real in, in most cases. There are those who will have symptoms that, that are helped by using marijuana, those who will just feel better by using marijuana, and those for whom both will be true. And I, I just don't, I, I don't see any prevailing public policy reason why um, there should continue to be any legal sanction for it. Um, and and I, I know that one of, one of the concerns um, in police enforcement that I, I've read about um, on the internet is <laughs> the availability of pot-related charges allows the, the police to intervene in lots of situations where no other criminal charges are being committed and to basically get people off the street who they want to get off the street for reasons good, bad, and in between. So I'll just add that. Um, let's close out this topic. Gentlemen, final words? I'll just say that we actually use utilitarianism and, and consequence-based rationale uh, all the time when looking at the limits of uh, criminal code provisions, when we're doing an Oaks analysis, looking at proportionality. So that's very much part and parcel. And, and to tie in with what Gary's comment was, that sure, there'll still be an illegal market in the marijuana trade, but that's, it's going to be targeted in exactly the way we want it to be. In other words, servicing minors or in, in alternate channels. And that's where we should be putting our police attention. That's the proper use of our law enforcement uh, resources. Not on, you know, these dispensaries that are, you know, selling marijuana to someone for, for a Friday night uh, at home, uh, which, which just seems absurd that, you know, that we're, we're going to criminalize that type of behavior. Well, are, are, are you really comfortable with all these places popping up on every corner of downtown Toronto? You know what? I, it's, it's interesting. It hasn't bothered me yet. I don't see why it should bother anyone. Uh, okay. Do, do, you have, do you have kids, Omar? How many kids do you have? I've lost track of how many. 
<laughs> that's not the point, Mitch. It has very little to do with that. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, okay. That's a different issue. Selling to minors, like I said, is a different issue than the fact that these stores are operating in violation of the federal law. And in in fairness to these operations, I don't have any any indication that they're selling to minors. And I, I both the places that that I walked into yesterday um, made it clear that they require ID to determine, among other things, age. I, I don't think they're targeting kids. And I don't know if kids are trying to get in there or what, 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 what that piece of it. Um, Bob, final words? Uh, you know, it, it's... I don't know that how strongly I disagree with anything that anybody has said um, because it strikes me that where this conversation is or, or where the majority of people's views are indicate that we're at a position where there's virtual consensus, if not exact consensus on the fact that this should not be subject to criminal sanction. Um, and it's regrettable that it's taking so long for us to get to a place where the law reflects sort of the public you know, the expressed public will on that. So I, I think the faster that the government moves on it, the better. Um, and I think the less that whether you're going to be hauled into criminal court depends on what, you know, the mayor or the police chief of a particular jurisdiction uh, decide to devote their attention to on a particular day, the better. Okay, so our, our takeaway then tonight is Tarantino slams Trudeau for moving too slowly on marijuana legalization. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> so is, is, he, is he even moving? I'm not, I, I don't know if slowly is the right okay, word. Well, he's, not, he's not even moving. I, I can see that we've, we've reached the point in the evening where Mitch and I are going to stop agreeing. <laughs> yeah. So what, what about <laughs> Trinity Western University? Um, in by way of background, Trinity Western is a Christian university in British Columbia. It wants to open a law school. And a condition of admission to Trinity, including the law school, is a covenant, and I'm quoting from the Law Times, um, a covenant that bans students from, quote, sexual intimacy that violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman, um, unquote. The, they applied, the, the university applied to the law societies throughout Canada in Ontario, BC, um, and both law societies of Ontario and British Columbia denied accreditation to the proposed Trinity Western Law School. I believe Nova Scotia has granted accreditation. No. Trinity Western has been litigating in Ontario and BC the denial by the Law Society of Accreditation. It, looks, it was argued in courts of appeals in both provinces um, recently, and this one looks like it's headed for the Supreme Court of Canada. Gentlemen, should we be accrediting Trinity Western as law schools, um, in, as a law school throughout Canada in, the, in view of the covenant that appears to propose some significant problems for anybody who isn't a married man or woman um, in a male-female couple who wants to have any form of sexual intimacy. Well, I, I think we've all been to law school and we all know that you're so busy you don't have time for sex. So this is really a non-issue. Um, <laughs> you're doing it wrong, Mitch. You're doing it wrong. No. <laughs> Mitch, you went to law school? Look, look. Yeah, I went to law school. Uh Look, we're asking people to refrain from sexual activity during three years of your life. I'm not sure that is something that uh, somehow is uh, discriminatory in any way. And, and I'm not sure how a graduate of Trinity Western suddenly becomes homophobic because they went to that law school and signed that covenant. And I'm not sure how someone who is uh, a, a hardcore Christian and who believes that um, is suddenly a, a homophobic person who cannot practice law. And lastly, we all know that Trinity Western 
uh, teacher's college was successful at the Supreme Court on a very similar issue about 10 years ago. And so I'm, I don't understand the difference between it's okay to have a teacher's college, have their uh, students sign this covenant, and then these people are going to teach our children across Canada uh, is okay, but somehow law students and becoming law uh, lawyers across Canada is, is wrong. Mitch, you're referring to a 2001 Supreme Court of Canada decision in Trinity Western versus correct. BC College of Teachers. BC College of Teachers, correct. Yeah, so in, in that case, the Supreme Court of Canada found that the covenant um, did not justify the refusal of the Teachers College um, to accredit graduates of Trinity Western, but according to those advocating on behalf of the Law Society, much has changed constitutionally in Canada since that 2001 decision, and should it be revisited, um, they anticipate a different answer from the, from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, I'm sure you can anticipate all you want. <laughs> Again, I mean, just, I mean, let's just, let's answer that basic question. It's okay for teachers. It's not okay for lawyers. That's not what the case is I, for. I don't think that's the basic yeah, I, I, I don't, don't think that's understand the, basic the philosophical. I think the basic question is what is the law now? And, and by definition. Well, um, the law by now is by definition sex, the Trinity Western case. A same sex That's the Supreme Court decision. That's the law. Could not go to Trinity Western Law School without lying. Um, and presumably, it's not just an admission criteria, um, it's also potentially no, no. a cr criteria for expelling a student who would be found to be in breach of that. Um, what, okay. what other <laughs> circumstance in Canada would it be legal to expel um, a, a, a gay person from job? residence or receipt of any government service. Give me one other example in Canada where that would be legal. Yeah, no, you're, you're asking the wrong question. I'm asking you the right question. What you're suggesting is that gay people do, cannot go to TWU. That's incorrect. Gay people are fully welcome at TWU, as far as I know, and is what TWU has said. What they've said is, we don't want you to have sex. Just like we don't want people who are heterosexual and single not to have sex. And is that properly in the, the domain of demands that can be made upon individuals at a school any more than they could be made by any employer a um, or a religious by, school. Um, by a, a... Like any other religious school. I'm sorry? It's a religious school. Right. And right? this is the religious very school question also that our law society that, has been called upon to answer. Do we want... Well, it's none of the law society's business. The law society should be looking as <clears throat> the federation said, the Federation of Law Societies of Canada accredited TWU said, yeah, that's fine. You have all the courses. If you take all this, you have what you need. The law societies of BC and Ontario and, and actually Nova Scotia as well have gone way beyond simply looking at a skills-based approach right and, and and jump to the conclusion that somehow people coming out of TWU are evil no they've and come to the conclusion that they, in the as law they can practice in Alberta they can practice in Saskatchewan they can practice in Manitoba the law society of upper canada has simply decided that it has a larger duty to the public to prevent discriminatory practices in conjunction with attain, obtaining accreditation to, to law school. I don't think it's more complicated okay. than that. Bob, what do you well, think? It's, well, I think the law societies are ignoring the right to freedom of religion. So it's we have a clashing of rights, it. neither of which are absolute okay. and which no, have I, to be balanced. Go ahead. So, so how do you balance the rights? Well, no, I think there are important rights to be balanced here. And, and I think that Christian schools can reasonably require um, certain codes of behavior. I'm not sure they can legally require these codes of behavior, but uh, that's not what the question is. The question is whether the law society um, in this province or any other province should be participating um, in accreditation of principles that 
are illegal in the province of Ontario under the Ontario Human Rights Code, as an example. Well, to be fair, I mean, Mitch's question is a subset of a larger issue, which is that law societies are making this decision or this determination in full light of the fact that there are conflicting charter values here. So I don't deny that there aren't charter values here at play, Mitch. My, my response is that TWU is more than welcome, in fact, to teach law and to talk about legal issues within the confines of their classroom in a private, private classroom. But they don't have a right to an accredited law school. That's not in the charter. So we're not denying them the freedom of religion simply by not accrediting their law school. There's an enormous distinction between the two. And as Gary pointed out, uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada's decision uh, goes back to its very, very long history of fighting racial discrimination in Ontario, fighting gender discrimination in Ontario. And, and, and sexual orientation is just literally one of the flavors of the week, literally, okay? And I think, you know, the, the events in Orlando only really highlight that much more why it is important to help create and foster an inclusive society where individuals, all individuals from all backgrounds, are taught to interact and respect other individuals who they do not agree and believe with. That's, that's actually one of the fundamental concepts of what we should be doing in a democracy. And it's even more important to impart those values to individuals who claim or aspire to be members of our profession. So how do you square that with freedom of religion? They're free to... Like I, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. What you're saying is that that you cannot have religious... What I'm saying is that religious values... Religious values are not or should not be imparted or imposed upon the legal community. The two should remain distinct entirely. And so they can still maintain their religious beliefs, but they maintain their yes. religious beliefs in the privacy of their own homes, in their own personal lives, in the manner in which they conduct themselves, but not as part of legal education. It's not part of legal education. Well, and it's, my part question, of their school. In, in, it's part of their religious beliefs. And it's a religious school. There are lots of other law schools you can go to if you don't agree with that those religious beliefs. If you wanna, if you're a heterosexual person and you want to have sex during law school and you're not married, then you don't go to TWU. You're simplifying it, Mitch, because uh, the community covenant well, goes it has well to be simplified. That. No, the community covenant goes well beyond that and actually says, and I'm going to read for you. Okay, it talks about okay. communication that is destructive to the TWU community life and interpersonal relationships, including gossip, slander, vulgar and obscene language and prejudice. I'm with them on that, okay? But the point is yeah, that's, that they it's actually have a lot of other things, including cultivating Christian virtues, okay? And so when you say, and, okay. and I'll go further, they say, you know, things like the university's acceptance of the Bible as divinely inspired. So what you're setting up here okay. is potentially saying that a person who is gay but still strongly believes that the Bible is divinely inspired and that Christ is, sure. the, is the main way in the character, like the person that they should follow in their life, et cetera, et cetera. In that rare instance, that person can maybe go to that law school. That's what you're proposing. No, what I'm saying is if you want to go to law school, you follow the covenant and you don't have sex unless you're married, man and woman. That's it. It's okay, absurd. Right. That's what I'm Get saying. Get rid of the covenant. Well, this is the point. They, but they it's, can part of their religion, it's part of their religious they can school. Be, they, they can certainly be accredited if, if the covenant execution and and any enforcement of it um, is not applicable in the school. Uh, I mean, Mitch, if, if we wanted to set up a university that was for um, people who covenanted only to practice homosexual sex um, at least four times a week and said to you, you as a straight person can come, but you must have homosexual sex at least three or four times a week, would that not be equally le legal? No, because you're what telling you me I have that, to do something as opposed to refraining from something. What's the difference? What's, what's the difference? It's, it's, I it's, think it's, 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 it's positive. the passive and the it's active a, roles in a homosexual relationship. Yeah, I have to not have sex is, yeah. is pretty much... That, that's a, that's an active requirement I would suggest okay, I, you know I I, 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 really I, I guess we're, we're gonna see on this we, because we, we have this been silent you know, way the, too long so 
<laughs> this is a really complicated issue on which I think reasonable people can disagree. Um, <laughs> my own, look, my own view, and, and I've been public about it for well over, you know, a decade, is that uh, gay marriage is something that we should have legalized 15 years ago. Uh, the legislature should have done it rather than hiding behind the skirts of the Supreme Court of Canada as a solid affirmation of the equality of, um, of uh, homosexual couples. Um, the question about whether TWU should be accredited uh, is a challenging one because the process has been a little bit convoluted. So they were accredited by the organization which is charged with accrediting law schools in Canada, the Federation of Law Societies. Um, the state of the law, I think it's fair to say, has changed since 2001 when the, the Supreme Court of Canada decision that they were relying on was handed down. Um, and I think the unfortunate reality is that this, the debate has become incredibly polarized. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of people who view themselves as, as uh, Christian. I, I'm not really sure what the sort of appropriate kind of terminology is, whether they're fundamentalist or, or uh, evangelical or whatever, but people who, who view, who, who sort of adhere to a, a a code of conduct in their personal lives, which meshes with TWU's code of conduct. Um, and, and so they're viewing, they hear a lot of the criticisms of TWU as being criticisms of their, their own faith. Um, so I think there's ways in which the law societies could have handled this better. Um, and I, you know, ultimately I, I, I disagree with TWU's covenant. Uh, it's not something that I could swear to. Uh, I, I think what would be interesting is if we had a consistent application of the principles uh, which people who are opposed to the TWU accreditation uh, espouse. And what I mean by that is we don't hold other law schools to the same standard uh, that we seem to be applying to TWU. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, I would recommend that people read an article which was written by Michael Plaxton and, and Charisma Mathen, um, which is really an interesting examination of the, the basis on which we can criticize TWU because and, and I think they come from a place which is similar to my own, which is, you know what, I don't think TWU should be asking its students uh, or its community members to adhere to this because I'm not a Christian. Um, I'm certainly not in accord with the, the various, you know, strictures that they're asking their community members to abide by. Um, but we don't ask other law schools or graduates of other law schools uh, to affirm, you know, their belief in equality, however expressed. Um, I'm really worried that the way that the test has been articulated by the Law Society of Upper Canada uh, could be applied in, in unfortunately negative ways down the road. Uh, I don't think we should be asking lawyers to affirm or, or disavow their own personal religious convictions. Um, and I, I, I worry that we might end up in a place like that uh, if, we, if we continue along the road in the way that it has been articulated by some critics. Of oh, that's right. a really Come and gone. point. Um, so we're going to wrap for this month. Um, you guys enjoying the blabs? It's all good. It's the only time we get to hang out. I know. Really? It's, uh... <laughs> and it's, it's good that we're an attack we're, missed. We're separated by technology so that uh, it keeps the lid on all of these arguments. So anyhow, let's say goodnight for now. Um, 
check out uh, our various blogs because we'll announce the date for the next one. Um, Mitch, Bob, Omar, thanks. Have a good night, and we'll catch you again next uh, time. Thanks again. Over. Take care.